Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome to Audibly Haunted. I'm your host, Ani Kachadorian. The paranormal is all around us. Sometimes, it's the lady in black that haunts your basement, or... Maybe the dark shadows that lurk out in nature, or maybe places of the past. And sometimes, the supernatural, the unexplainable, live within the pages of the books upon your shelves. Here at Audibly Haunted, we dive into different haunted literary works, myths, and folklores every week, simply trying to, well, make sense of it all. You can find Audibly Haunted on Instagram at Audibly Haunted. And you can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Again, welcome to Audibly Haunted. So, let's dive into that. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. history, literature, and storytelling. Do you like cool clothes? Like showing off what you listen to while you drink your coffee, tea, or even milk? Do you want people to remark, wow, what a cool person? Then why not take a look at the In the Great Khan's Tent merchandise shop. We have cool designs and great items for an affordable price. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Links to the store are available on the website, on this episode description, and on our various social media accounts. We can even email you the link if you prefer. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. In this episode, we conclude our first special series in The Great Khan's Tent Presents Tales from Central Asia with episode 4 focusing on tales from the Azerbaijani, Kyrgyz, and Kazakh ethnic groups. The first two stories that are told are the Azerbaijani tales, the story of Zarniar who had all her wits about her, and Shaidullah the Loafer. The story of Shaidullah the Loafer is an interesting one, as it is one of the only tales we have encountered in this special series and in our main series, The 1001 Nights, where the main character does not have any redeeming traits at all. This clearly is a moral tale warning of the acts of sloth and not performing your duty when other people are relying on you. The third tale we encounter is the Kyrgyz story of which was the biggest. If you can tell me which was the biggest, email me your answers at in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com and I'll compile the answers and present all the votes for the next episode. The last tale we encounter in this special series is the Kazakh tale of Aldar Koz and Shigai Bai. Aldar Koz is an extremely popular character in Kazakhstan and is known for all the tricks he plays on those who are greedy or on evil khans, but is also kind and helps the poor and the weak. Although this special series is ending, fear not listeners, we have a new special series in the works and it will begin soon. So stay tuned and enjoy listening to this episode. The story of Zarniar who had all her wits about her, an Azerbaijani fairy tale. Azerbaijanis 
are a Turkic ethnic group living mainly within the Azerbaijan region of northwestern Iran and the Republic of Azerbaijan. They are predominantly Shia Muslims and belong to the Oghuz branch of the Turkic peoples. They migrated to the region of Azerbaijan beginning in the 11th century under the Seljuk dynasty and continued to migrate into the region and remained a prominent presence. This is a story about a merchant named Mahmed who lived in the city of Misar. One day Mahmed bethought him of going off to trade in a distant land. He bought a large number of goods, hired servants, and bidding farewell to his family, set out on his way with his caravan. Having traveled for many months and visited many different places, he came at last to a city he had never heard of before. There he decided to rest after his long travels and put up at a caravanserai. As he sat there eating and drinking, a stranger came up to him. You must have come from distant parts if you do not know the customs of this city, merchant, the man said. And what are the customs of this city, Mehmed asked. I'll tell you what they are. Every merchant who comes here presents a gift to the Shah. In return, the Shah invites the merchant to his palace and plays a game of Nardi with him. What was Mehmed to do? He knew he had to go to the Shah whether he liked to or not. So choosing the richest silks he had, he laid them on a golden tray and set off for the palace. The Shah took the gifts and piled the merchant with questions, asking him where he came from, what goods he traded in, and what cities he had visited. Mahmed answered him truthfully, and the Shah heard him out and said, Come to my palace tonight, and you and I will play Nardi. Mehmed came to the palace at sunset, and there was the Shah waiting for him, the Nardi board set up before him. Hear me out, merchant, said the Shah. I have a learned cat that can balance seven lighted lamps on its tail for hours on end. If not one of them falls off while we are playing, all your wares will be mine and you will be bound and thrown in a dungeon. But if the cat so much as moves from its place, all the riches in my treasury will be yours, and you can do with me whatever you wish. Mahmed sat there listening to the shah, and he cursed himself silently for ever having come to the city, for he knew that he could not run away, and to protest was out of the question. There was no way out but to do as the shah said. One can easily lose one's life here, let alone one's wares, thought he. The shah now called his learned cat, and the cat came and twirled its tail and sat down in front of him. Bring the lamps, the shah commanded, and seven lamps were at once brought in and placed on the cat's tail. The shah moved closer to the board, and the game began. The merchant could not help himself and kept glancing at the cat as he played. The cat sat there as if turned to stone and did not so much as stir. So a day passed and a night, and then another two days and two nights, and the game went on. The cat sat there as before. At last, Mehmed could bear it no longer. I cannot play any more. You win, Shah, he cried. That was all the Shah was waiting for. He called his servants and said to them, Bring me all of the merchant's wares and all his gold, and as for the merchant himself, bind him and throw him in the dungeon. The servants did as the Shah bade, and Mahmed found himself in a dungeon. He sat there and cursed the Shah and his learned cat, and he himself too for not having the to pass the city by. 
But now let us leave Mamed for a while so I can tell you about his wife, Zerniar. Zerniar was at home where Mehmed had left her, waiting patiently for his return, but he did not come and she began worrying about him. Perhaps something has happened to him, thought she. One day, when she had lived with these anxious thoughts for a long time, Mehmed's servant, who had gone with him on his travels, appeared at her doorstep. His face was streaked with dirt, and his clothes were in tatters. Hear me, mistress, cried he. The Shah of a far-off land has imprisoned the master and seized all his goods. I alone of the servants was able to run away, and I barely escaped with my life. What are we going to do? Zarniyar bade the servant to tell her the whole sad story. She heard him out to the end, and then ordered a large number of mice to be caught and placed in a chest. When this had been done, she dressed herself in man's clothing, hid her long hair under a high fur cap, and taking a bagful of gold and silver, set off at the head of a caravan to rescue her husband. She journeyed without halting or delays of any kind, and in due time arrived in the city where her husband was. She bade some of her servants to wait at the caravanserai for her and the rest go with her to the Shah's palace. Then, taking a large golden tray, she placed on it many costly gifts and set out for the palace accompanied by the servants who walked behind her carrying the chest full of mice. They neared the palace, and Zarniar said to the servants, I shall be in the Shah's chamber, playing Nardi with him, and you must let the mice in through the door one by one. The servants remained at the door with the chest, and Zarniar entered the Shah's chamber. She said to the Shah, Long years to you, O ruler of rulers, I brought you rich gifts, as is the custom of your country. Taking her for a man, the Shah welcomed Zarniyar graciously, put the choicest delicacies before her, and invited her to join him in a game of Nardi. What are your rules, O ruler of rulers? asked Zarniyar, said the Shah. We shall play until my learned cat moves from its place. If it does, then I will have lost the game, and you shall do with me whatever you wish. Very well, said Zarniar, let it be as you say. The Shah called his learned cat, and the cat padded in and sat down very solemnly in front of him. Then the Shah's servants appeared, bringing seven lamps which they placed on the cat's tail. The game began and the Shah smiling as he played and only waiting for the young merchant to admit himself the loser. Some time passed and Zarniyar's servants opened the chest and let a mouse into the Shah's chamber. When the cat saw the mouse, its eyes began to glitter and it made as if to move from its place. But the Shah looked at it so sternly that it quietened at once and seemed frozen to the spot. In a little while, Zarniar's servants let several more mice into the chamber. The mice began running up and down the floor and scuttling about near the walls. Now, this was too much for the cat, learned though it was. It gave a meow and jumping up suddenly, whereupon all seven lamps dropped to the floor and began chasing the mice. And shout as the Shah might, it would not listen to him. Then only did Zarniar call her servants, who rushed into the room, bound the Shah hand and foot, and began belaboring him with leather thongs, and they would not stop even when he called for mercy. I will let out all my captives and give back to them all I took away. Only spare me, the Shah cried. But Zarniar's servant went on whipping him, and though his people heard the Shah's cry, they would not come to his aid, for all all had grown weary of his cruelty and greed. Zarniar had freed her husband and all those who were with him, and had the Shah thrown into the dungeon. After that, Zarniar and Mehmed returned to their native city of Misar and lived there in peace and happiness. Shaidullah the Loafer
Long before our time, there lived a man named Shaidullah, who was a loafer and a never-do-well, and whose wife and children went hungry most of the time. His wife would scold Shaidullah for not wanting to work, and Shaidullah would say, Never you mind, we are poor now, but we shall soon be rich. What do you mean? the wife would exclaim. How can that be when you lie there day after day without so much as moving a finger? But Shaidullah would repeat again, just you wait, the time will come when we will be rich. The wife waited and the children waited, but nothing happened and they remained as poor as ever. It's no use waiting, the wife said. If this goes on, we shall starve to death. So Shaidullah decided to go to a wise man and ask his counsel about how he could stop being poor. He got ready and was soon on his way, and it was after he had walked for three days and three nights that he met a scraggy, skinny wolf. Where are you going, my good man? The wolf asked to a wise man to seek his counsel about how to become rich. Shaidullah replied, Perhaps he can tell you what I am going to do to get well, said the wolf. For two years now I have been suffering from pains in the stomach that give me no peace day or night. Very well, Shaidullah said, I'll ask him about it. And he went on his way. He walked for another three days and three nights, and he came to an apple tree growing by the wayside. Where are you going, my good fellow? The apple tree asked him. To a wise man to ask his counsel about how to get rich without having to work. Perhaps the wise man can tell you what I am to do too, said the apple tree. I bloom every spring, but my blossoms shrivel and fall off, and I never bear any fruit. Very well, I'll ask him about it, Shaidullah said, and he went on his way again. He walked for another three days and three nights, and he came to a large lake. All of a sudden, a big fish thrust its head up out of the water. Where are you going, my good fellow? asked the fish to a wise man to ask his counsel. Won't you please ask him what I am to do to get well? For six years now, I have been suffering from a sharp pain in the throat. Very well, I'll ask him, said Shaidullah, and went on. He walked for three days and three nights, and he came to a place where grew many rose bushes. Under one of them sat an old man with a long gray beard. What do you want, Shaidullah? the old man asked. Shaidullah was startled. How did you know my name? asked he. But perhaps you are the wise man I was on my way to see. Yes, I am, the old man replied. Tell me quickly what it is you want of me. Shaidullah told him why he had come. Is there nothing else you want to ask of me? said the wise man. There is, Shaidullah replied, and he told the wise man what the wolf, the apple tree, and the fish wanted of him. Said the wise man, a large gem is lodged in the throat of the fish. The fish will be cured soon as the gem is removed. A large jug of silver is buried under the apple tree. The tree will begin bearing fruit again as soon as the jug is taken away. As for the wolf, if he is to be cured, he must swallow the first loafer who comes along. And what about my own request? Shaidullah asked. What you wish for has already been granted. You can go now. Shaidullah was overjoyed and went home without another word. He walked and he walked till he came to the lake where the fish was waiting for him. Has the wise man told you what I am to do? It asked. A gem is lodged in your throat. Take it out and you will be well again, said Shaidullah, and he turned to go. Do help me, my good man, and take the gem out of my throat, the fish cried. You will have cured me and gotten the gem for yourself at one and the same time. Why should I bother, said Shaidullah. I am going to become rich without moving a finger. And with these words, he went on. He came to the apple tree, and at the sight of him all its brows began trembling, and all its leaves rustling. 
Has a wise man told you what I am to do? The apple tree asked. Yes, he has, Shaidullah replied. A large jug of silver lies buried under your roots. As soon as it is taken out, you will bear fruit again. And with these words, Shaidullah turned to go. Said the apple tree in pleading tones, Please, Shaidullah, dig out the jug. You will be helping yourself too, for you will get the silver. Oh no, I can't be bothered. The wise man told me I would have everything anyway, Shaidullah replied, and he went on. He walked and he walked till he met the scraggy wolf. Did the wise man tell you what I am to do, he asked, trembling in impatience. Don't keep me in suspense. Tell me at once. Eat up the first loafer who comes along and you will be well, said Shaidullah. And the wolf thanked Shaidullah and began asking him about all he had seen and heard on the way. And Shaidullah told him of the fish and the apple tree and of what they had asked of him. But I did not bother with them, he said, for I will be rich anyway. The wolf listened and was overjoyed. I need not search for a loafer, thought he, for he has come to me himself. There is no one in the world more lazy than this man. And pouncing on Shaidullah, he gobbled him up on the spot. And that was the end of Shaidullah the loafer. Which was the biggest? A Kyrgyz fairy tale. <laughs> The Kyrgyz are a Turkic ethnic group which is native to Central Asia. They are primarily found within the countries of Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, but are also present in the modern-day countries of China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan. The modern Kyrgyz people are descended in part from the Yenisei Kyrgyz that lived in the Yenisei River Valley in Siberia. They established the Yenisei Kaganate in the 9th century CE and later a Kyrgyz Khanate in the 15th century CE. They are predominantly Muslims of the Hanafi persuasion thanks in part to the work of Sufi missionaries in the 17th century. Long, long ago, in a certain village, there lived three brothers who had nothing but one piebald bull between them. One day the brothers decided to separate and live apart. But how was one bull to be divided among the three of them? At first they thought of selling him, but found no one in the neighborhood rich enough to buy him. Then they thought of slaughtering him and dividing the meat, but this they could not do, for they were very sorry for him. And so they decided to go to a wise man that he might settle the matter for them. As the wise man says, so will we do, they said, and set off with the bull for the wise man's village. The eldest brother walked by the bull's head, the middle brother by the bull's side, and the youngest brother came behind the bull and drove him on with a stick. At dawn they were overtaken by a man on horseback who greeted the youngest brother and then asked him where he was driving the bull. The youngest brother told him all about everything. We are taking the bull to a wise man who is going to settle the matter once and for all, he said. And he added as he bade the horseman goodbye, you will soon overtake my middle brother. He is walking by the bull's side. Give him my regards and tell him to urge on the bull. We want to get to the wise man's village before nightfall. Very well, said the horseman, and putting his horse into a trot, he rode away. At noon he caught up with the middle brother who was walking by the bull's side. Your younger brother sends you his best regards and asks you to urge on the bull. 
if you want to get where you are going before dark said he the middle brother thanked the horseman when you ride up to the bull's head he said give my regards to my elder brother and ask him to urge on the bull we want to reach the wise man's village as soon as we can the horseman rode on and it was evening by the time he reached the bull's head and passed on to the elder brother what his middle brother had said there is nothing i can do said the eldest brother it is already dusk we'll have to stop and spend the night by the wayside and he slowed his steps but the horseman did not stop and rode on the brothers spent the night in the steppe and on the following morning started out again with the bull all of a sudden the most terrible thing happened a huge eagle swooped down from the sky seized the bull in its claws lifting him up to the clouds and flew away the brothers grieved and sorrowed for a time and then went back home empty-handed the eagle flew on with the bull in its claws soon it spied below a flock of goats and among them one which had the longest of long horns the eagle dropped down perched on the goat's horn and began pecking and tearing the bull and strewing its bones all around all of a sudden it began to rain and the goat herd and its flock of goats took shelter underneath the selfsame goat's beard suddenly the goat herd felt a sharp pain in his left eye a moat must have got into my eye he thought two words evening as he drove his flock to the village the pain grew worse call forty doctors good folk he cried let them sail in my eye in forty boats and find the moat not a moment of peace does it give me and the villagers went and found forty doctors get into your boats and sail in the eye of our goat herd doctors said they find the moat and put an end to his pain only see that you don't injure the eye the forty doctors set sail in the goat herd's eye in their forty boats and found the moat which was not a moat at all but the bull's blade bone which had gotten into the goat herd's eye while he was sheltering from the rain under the goat's beard after that the goat herd's eye stopped hurting him and the doctors all went home and the bull's blade bone was taken far beyond the village and thrown away now soon after this some nomads happened to be passing the place where the blade bone lay night was approaching and they spoke among themselves and decided to stop and build a fire there this salt marsh is the best and safest place we can find to spend the night said they but when they were all settled and about to go to sleep the ground beneath their feet began trembling and quaking the nomads and piling their belongings onto their carts moved off in haste only when morning came did they recover from their fright and set up camp and they sent forty horsemen back to the place where the earthquake had been to find out what it was that had caused it the forty horsemen were soon there and they saw what they had taken for a salt marsh was really a huge bone the blade bone of a bull at which a fox was gnawing even as they watched so that is what made the earth tremble the horsemen cried and taking aim they let fly their arrows and killed the fox after that they set to work and began skinning it but they only succeeded in skinning one side of it for hard as they tried they could not turn the fox over they returned to their camp and told the elders all about it and the elders began thinking what to do just then a young woman came up to them do please give me a piece of fox skin your horsemen have brought for i want to make a cap for my newborn baby she said the elders gave it to her and the woman measured her baby's head and began cutting a cap for him out of the fox skin but she soon saw that there was only enough fur to make half a cap so she went to the elders again and asked them to give her the second half of the fox skin the elders called 
the forty horsemen, and the forty horsemen confessed that they had not been able to turn the fox over and skin its other side. If one half of the fox skin is too small for you to make your baby a cap out of it, said they to the woman, then you had better go and skin the fox's other side yourself. The woman took her baby and went to where they had felled the fox. She turned the fox over easily, skinned its other side, and made her baby a cap from the two halves of the skin. Now, here is a question for you. Which do you think was the biggest? Was it the bull? Don't forget it took a man on horseback a whole day to ride from its tail to its head. Was it the eagle? Don't forget that it carried the bull with it to the sky. Was it the goat? Don't forget that it was on its horns that the eagle perched and pecked at the bull. Was it the goat herd? Don't forget that forty doctors sailed in his eye in forty boats was it the fox don't forget that it started an earthquake by gnawing at the bull's blade bone was it the baby don't forget that it was as much as its mother could do to make it a cap from the whole of the fox's skin or was it the woman who had such a giant of a baby think hard now and perhaps you will know the answer Aldar Koz and Shigai by a Kazakh fairy tale. The Kazakhs are a Turkic ethnic group that is native to Central Asia and Eastern Europe but are mainly found in Kazakhstan and parts of northern Uzbekistan, but are also found in northwestern China and western Mongolia. The Kazakhs as an ethnic group arose from the merging of the Turkic and Mongolian tribes in the 15th century. This was further solidified during the foundation of the Kazakh Khanate during 1456 to 1465 CE under the sultans Janibek and Karai. The Kazakhs are predominantly Muslim. In olden times there lived in the steppe a poor man named Aldar Koz. He had nothing to his name but one horse, but he was very clever and always had a whole store of tricks up his sleeve. Now in the very same step there also lived a rich man by the name of Shigai Bai. Shigai Bai was very stingy. In fact, he was even more stingy than he was wealthy. Such was his stinginess that he would not offer a guest so much as a slice of bread or a drink of water. One day, Aldar Koz, who wanted to teach Shigai Bai a lesson, got on his horse and went to pay him a visit. When his friends and neighbors learnt where Aldar Koz was going, they burst out laughing. Just you wait, Aldar Koz, said they. Shigai Bai will feast you royally. You will have your fill of fat mutton and of the choicest iron. We shall see about that, said Aldar Koz. He rode over the steppe for many days, looking for Shigai Bai's yurta, but wherever he went he was told that Shigai Bai had gone away and that he was to look for him elsewhere. There was nothing to be done, and Aldar Koz rode on. At long last he came to a solitary yurta, thick rushes growing all around it. There must be some reason for Shigai Bai to have made his home amidst the rushes, Aldar Koz told himself, and he was right, for Shigai Bai wanted himself and his family to know beforehand if a stranger were anywhere near. The rustling of the rushes warned them of his approach, and then they would try to hide all the food in the house so as to keep from sharing it with their visitor. 
This was at once divined by the quick-witted Aldar Coz, and he began to think of a way of passing through the rushes noiselessly and getting to Shigai Bai's yurta without being heard. He thought and he thought, and he hit on a cunning plan. Leading his horse off to one side, he began collecting small stones and pebbles and did not stop until he had a good many. After that he waited till it grew dark and then began throwing the stones one at a time into the growth of rushes. He threw a stone and the rushes swayed and rustled. Shigai Bai rushed out of the yurta. He looked around him and listened for a moment. Who is there? he called. No one answered and Shigai Bai went back into his yurta. Then Aldar Koz threw another stone. The rushes rustled and Shigai Bai darted out of the yurta again. He looked to all sides of him but saw no one. It must be the wind swaying the rushes, said Shigai Bai to himself, and he stopped running out of the yurta. That was what Aldar Koz was waiting for. He took his horse by the reins and began making his way through the rushes to the miser's yurta. He would take a step and stop and wait a while, take another, then stop and wait again. In this way he succeeded in reaching the door of the yurta. He lifted the hanging of thick felt and looked in. The yurta was crammed with all sorts of things. Everywhere were rugs and cushions and heavy chests piled one on top of another. And in the middle of the floor by the fire sat Shigai Bai and his family. Mutton was boiling in a large pot hanging over the fire and Shigai Bai was watching it and tasting it now and again to see if it was ready. And he was stuffing a skin with minced meat and making a sausage at the same time. Shigai Bai's wife was kneading dough, his daughter was plucking a goose, and his workman was singeing a sheep's head. Aldar Koz stepped inside. Good evening, he said. The same instant, Shigai Bai banged shut the lid of the pot and sat down on top of the sausage. His wife seated herself on the dough. His daughter covered the goose with the hem of her skirt, and his workman hid the sheep's head behind his back. Shigai Bai greeted Aldar Kos and asked him what news he had brought if he had anything of interest to tell him. I have indeed, said Aldar Kos. In fact, I have seen so many curious things on my way here that it would take too long to tell you about them all. If you cannot tell me about all of them, tell me about some of them, said Shigai Bai. Well, as I was riding up to your yurta, I saw a snake that was bigger than the sausage you sat down on when I stepped inside. Shigai Bai made a face but said nothing. What's more, the snake had a head as large and black as the sheep's head that your workman just hid behind his back, Aldar Koz went on. Shigai Bai made a face again, but said nothing as before. And it hissed as it crawled along, just like the pot in which your mutton is cooking, said Aldar Koz. What I did was jump off my horse and go at the snake with a heavy stone. Its head was squished and it looked like the dough on which your wife is sitting. If I have lied to you, may I meet the same fate? as the goose your daughter has just plucked. Shigai Bai winced, so waxed was he, but not a word did he say, nor did he offer any of the food to Aldar Kos. Aldar Kos and Shigai Bai sat talking till late, and the mutton kept boiling and sizzling in the pot, a delicious odor filling the yurta. Aldar Kos had been long on the way, he was hungry, and he kept glancing at the pot, his mouth watering. Shigai Bai noticed it and said, Boil for a year, my pot, 
At this, Aldar Koz took off his boots, stretched himself out on the floor, yawned and said, Rest for two years, my boots. Seeing that his guest did not intend to leave, Shigai Bai decided to go to bed without his supper. The others followed suit, leaving the pot of mutton on the tripod. As soon as Aldar Koz falls asleep, Shigai Bai told himself, I'll wake up the family and we'll have some mutton. As soon as Shigai Bai falls asleep, Aldar Koz told himself, I'll eat my fill. Why should I go hungry when the mutton in the pot is all cooked? Shigai Bai was the first of the two to fall asleep. He lay there for a time and then his eyes closed and his snores filled the yurta. Aldar Koz rose, took out the mutton, and ate it, and then threw Shigai Bai's old boots into the pot. After that, he closed the pot, lay down again, and waited to see what would happen. After a time, Shigai Bai woke up, listened a moment, looked at Aldar Koz, and believing him to be asleep, began prodding his wife and daughter awake. Wake up, wake up now, he said. We'll have some mutton while Aldar Koz sleeps. Shigai Bai removed the lid, took out his boots, which he thought to be pieces of meat, and cut them up with his knife. They all began to eat. They chewed and chewed, but they could not bite through the pieces. What was wrong? Why was the meat so tough? It's all that good for nothing, Aldar Koz's fault, said Shigai Bai to his wife. It's because of him that the mutton's grown so tough. But never mind, when he gets out of here, we'll cook it some more till it turns soft and then eat it. And now put the pieces back in the pot. Shigai Bai's wife gathered up the pieces of leather and put them in the pot. And Shigai Bai told her to make up the fire and bake him some flat cakes out of yesterday's dough. When the flat cakes were baked, Shigai Bai thrust them into his bosom without waiting for them to cool, and went out into the steppe to take a look at his herds. No sooner had the miser left the yurta, than he was followed by Aldar Koz, who ran up to him and said, Ah, Shigai Bai, what a good thing it is that I woke up, or I would have had to leave without saying goodbye to you. I will soon be going home. He threw his arms around Shigai Bai, and pressed him close, and the flat cakes burned the miser badly. Shigai Bai bore the pain at first, but then, unable to stand it any longer, cried, Oh, oh, they're burning me, they're burning me, and he took them out from his bosom. Let the dogs eat them, he cried. How now, Shigai Bai, said Aldar Koz, why would you feed your dogs with flat cakes? Why not treat me to some of them? And he seized the flat cakes and ate them. Your wife makes fine flat cakes, Shigai Bai, said Aldar Koz. I've eaten none so good for a long time. Shigai Bai made no answer, and hungry though he was, rode off to the steppe. He returned home in the evening, and lo, there was Aldar Koz sitting in his yurta. Did you not say goodbye to me? I thought you were leaving, said Shigai Bai. I was going to, but I thought better of it. Aldar Koz replied, I like it here in your yurta. Shigai Bai frowned in vexation, but there was nothing to be done. He could not very well turn his guest out. The following morning, Shigai Bai again prepared to go out to the steppe, and he said to his wife, Give me a flask of Aran to take with me, but mind that Aldar Koz does not see you. Shigai Bai's wife filled a large leather flask with iron and gave it to him, and Shigai Bai hid the flask under the flap of his robe and left the yurta. All will be well this time, he said to himself, but this was not to be, for Aldar Koz at once ran out and threw his arms around him. So close did he clasp Shigai Bai, that the flask of iron overturned and the iron ran down Shigai Bai's robe. Mad with rage, Shigai Bai seized the flask, thrust it in Aldar Koz's hand and cried, Drink, drink, 
And so I shall, since you ask me to, Aldar Koz replied, I do not like to offend you by refusing. And he drank up all the iron. Once again, Shigai Bai rode off hungry, and Aldar Koz came into the yurta and began chatting with his wife and daughter. Aldar Koz stayed at the miser's house for many days. No matter what cunning Shigai Bai used, or what tricks he thought of, he could not outwit his guest. Willy-nilly, he was obliged to feed Aldar Koz. From morning till night, Shigai Bai kept thinking of a way of turning his guest out of his yurta and of revenging himself upon him. Aldar Koz had come to him on a horse with a white star on his head, and Shigai Bai now decided to kill the horse. He looked at the horse intently every time he chanced to go past it, and there was a look of malice in his eye. Aldar Koz did not fail to see this, and that same evening he took some soot and smeared it over the white star of his horse's head, dabbing some white clay on the head of Shigai Bai's best stallion at the same time. Then he went into the yurta and to bed. Night came and Shigai Bai stole out of the yurta, found the horse with the white star on its head, and killed it. Oh, oh, you have fallen on evil days, Aldar Koz, he shouted. Someone has killed your horse. But Aldar Koz stayed where he was. Do not take it so hard, Shigai Bai, said he. You and I will now have plenty of meat to eat. At this, Shigai Bai laughed in glee. So pleased was he that he had at last revenged himself on his hated guest. Only in the morning did he see that he had slaughtered his own best stallion. Shigai Bai nearly burst with fury, but there was no help for it, and he had to cook the meat and share it with Aldar Koz. But at last there came the day when Aldar Koz himself grew weary of staying with Shigai Bai. He decided to go back to his own village and to carry Shigai Bai's daughter off with him. Far better for her if she marries me, he told himself. Living as she does in the house of her father, she is sure to become as stingy as he. Now Shigai Bai's daughter was named Biz Bulduk, and she had liked the high-spirited Aldar Koz at the sight and kept stealing glances at him. One morning, when Shigai Bai was about to ride off to the steppe, as usual, and had already mounted his horse, Aldar Koz said to him, I have been your guest long enough, Shigai Bai. It is time I went home. When you return at night, there will be room enough and to spare in your yurta. Shigai Bai could hardly believe his ears. Only give me your biz, Aldar Koz went on. I want to repair my boots before I leave. Very well, very well, said Shigai Bai. Take the biz, repair your boots, and be off with you. It's high time. And with these words, he left the yurta. And as for Aldar Koz, he came inside and said to Shigai Bai's wife, Get biz bulduk ready, my good woman. She is coming with me. Are you out of your mind? Shigai Bai's wife exclaimed. Do you think that Shigai Bai will ever let a beggar like you marry our daughter? He has given her to me already. If you don't believe me, ask him yourself. Shigai Bai's wife ran out of the yurta. Shigai Bai, she called. Is it true that our biz is to be Aldar Koz's? It is, it is, Shigai Bai called back. Give him our biz and let him get out of the house. And with these words, Shigai Bai whipped up his horse and rode away. Shigai Bai's wife dared not disobey him, and she got her daughter ready and led her out of the yurta, and Aldar Koz put the girl on the horse with the white star on its head, and away they rode, leaving Shigai Bai's yurta far behind them. You will live among good people and become good yourself, said Aldar Koz. 
It was evening when Shigai Bai came back. Learning about what had taken place in his absence, he turned red with rage, leapt on his horse's back, galloped off in pursuit of Aldar Koz. He rode all over the steppe, but he could not find him anywhere and had to come back empty-handed. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. Welcome to the vocabulary section for this episode. First, let's look at some of the terms used in this episode. Zarniar, a Muslim female name meaning gilded, gilt, or inlaid with gold. Mahmed is another form of the name Muhammad. Misar, a city currently in the Hamadan province in Iran. Caravanserai, an inn with a central courtyard for travelers in the regions of Asia or North Africa. Shah, royal title used by Persianate societies. Nardi, also known as backgammon. Thongs, a strip of leather or hide. Shaidullah, a Muslim male name meaning witness of Allah. Loafer, a person who idles time away. Never do well. A person who is lazy and irresponsible. Shrivel. Wrinkle and contract or cause to wrinkle and contract, especially due to loss of moisture. Scraggy. Very thin and not looking healthy. Piebald. Having irregular patches of two colors. Wayside. The edge of the road. Goat herd. A person who tends goats. Moat. A tiny piece of substance. Blade bone, the scapula or shoulder blade. Salt marsh, an area of coastal grassland that is regularly flooded by seawater. Aldar Koz means beardless deceiver. Iran, a drink made of fermented milk. Yurta, a light round tent of skins or felt used by nomads in Central Asia. Rushes, a family of flowering plants superficially resembling grasses and sedges. Swaying, move or cause to move slowly or rhythmically backwards and forwards or from side to side. Singeing, burn something superficially or lightly. Flat cakes, a thin cake of batter fried in a pan or a griddle. Bosom, The space between a person's clothing and chest used for carrying things. Flask, a container for liquid. Biz, an all. Now let's look at some of the words used in this episode. Be thought, think on reflection or come to think. Learned, having much knowledge acquired by study. Streaked, cover a surface with streaks. Tatters, irregularly torn pieces of cloth, paper, or other material. Glitter, shine with a bright, shimmering, reflective light. Quietened, make or become quiet or calm. Sternly, in a serious and severe manner, especially when asserting authority or exercising discipline. Be laboring, attack or assault someone physically or verbally. Impatience, the tendency to be impatient, irritably, or restlessness. Strewing, scatter or spread things untidily over a surface or area. Piling, place things one on top of another. Stingy, 
unwilling to give or spend, ungenerous. Wexed, difficult and much debated or problematic. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on coffee. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please click on the link available on our many social media platforms or email us. Why not donate to our coffee to show your appreciation? Every bit helps and we thank you for your continued support. We love that our listeners love listening to us. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by Saf Big. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and or night. And may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.